What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Foosball. As always, it's your boy Nick. Here to hit you with the second team outlook of the day. We hit Houston Texans earlier this morning. Indy Colts right now to wrap up team outlook Thursday. Next Tuesday will be the last of the team outlooks. The last two remaining squads. The Titans and the Jaguars. So as always, if you're enjoying the team outlooks, if you enjoyed this video, you found it informational, it helped you, give it that thumbs up. I appreciate your support. I appreciate you spending time with me. So let's get cracking. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitter. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy. All my personal social media and stuff and all that other kind of stuff is in the description if you want it. So let me read my blog post from mid-July. I don't think enough people are talking about the fact that Andrew Luck hasn't even started throwing yet and we're more than halfway through July. Well, he started throwing at the end of July, but I wrote this way before that happened, way before it was cool to be getting off the luck hype train. Everyone was still drafting his QB3 about that around that time. What happened is he had surgery on his throwing shoulder and he hadn't fully recovered from it yet and he just started throwing at the end of July. So rather than being able to strengthen his arms, his shoulder, practice throws, you know, just improve as a player over the offseason, he hasn't been able to because he's been rehabbing from the shoulder surgery. Being that elite prospect, I swear Sports Center ruined Andrew Luck's prospects for me. Being that elite prospect coming out of college, he will continually be drafted among the elite quarterbacks in fantasy football, but he should not be. It's actually something I've been saying for like a year, or maybe even two years, but I've had enough people tell me to shut up every time I bring it up that I stop talking about it. I mean, we caught a glimpse of what Luck can do, right? Back in 2014, when he played the full, the full 16 games, 4,761 passing yards and 40 scores through the air. Uh, added another 270 yards and three scores with his legs. While they're really nice numbers, they're impressive. 4,700 passing yards has been done by a ton of quarterbacks since then. So that's not crazy. The 40 touchdowns, of course, is a very nice ceiling. But since then, since 2014, he's played in just 22 games. He's average and impressive. 278 passing yards a game, but it's certainly not by any means elite. And his completion percentage over that span has been 60.6%. That's not good for the NFL. Luck needs to be moved down everybody's draft board especially until we figure out this, this pup situation, the PUP. There's reports just going crazy every day about whether or not he will be on the pup list to start the season, well, whether he'll be taken off. Most of the reports are saying, you know, he's telling everyone to relax. He will be off the pup list prior to the start of the season. That doesn't mean that he's the starter for week one. They could take him off the pup list. All that means is he won't have to sit out the first six weeks. So if they start him on the pup, he's out at least six weeks. If they don't start him out the, uh, on the pup, that means he'll be available to play, but that doesn't mean he'll be ready and he'll be starting. So there's a lot of mystery here. In my opinion, his ceiling is not as high as those elite guys he's being drafted around, like the Brady and the Aaron Rodgers. And I would argue, I, I, I won't even argue, I'm telling you, his floor is not as good as a guy like Drew Brees or arguably a guy like Matt Ryan with all the weapons that he has in that offense. So like I said, Lux an elite raw talent for sure, but there's tons of red flags going into the 2017 season. One of them includes the offensive line, which is just never, it's been a consistent problem for him every year. PFF has them rated as the 22nd best line, or the 22nd, I guess, worst line heading into the year. Football Outsiders has them rated as the 28th pass blocking line in the NFL, so that'll be a problem once again. I guess when it's all said and done, the noise surrounding his rehab and his injury timetable might actually push his ADP to be a value. And we've seen it slowly happening, right? So since the news dropped on, I think it was July 24th, the report came out that he would miss the entire preseason. His ADP has dropped to 66 overall, and now he's officially quarterback four behind Rodgers, Brady, and Breeze. Now he was going nearly 12 spots higher than that prior to the news coming out. And that's honestly a trend I expect to continue until we hear another blurb about how he's ready to go. So I think he'll continue to fall until the point where he's actually a value play. So. If he can clear the PUP and he's expected to be ready for the season, Lux is gonna be a steal. Right now he's with 66th overall, that's seventh round pick in 10 team leagues. That's a great value. Anytime in the seventh round or later you can get Luck, I'm fine with that. But in the beginning of the summer where he was going, I was not okay with that. Now, for T.Y. Hilton's sake, I am praying that Andrew Luck is ready to go. Hilton's just 27 years old and he's officially entering, if he's not already entered the prime of his career. He led the NFL in receiving yards last year, just about 1,450 yards, tied 
for 10th in the NFL, 91 catches, and had the fourth most targets with 155. So last year was his fourth consecutive season with at least 130 targets and at least 1,050 receiving yards which easily puts him in elite company. Not only high production, but consistency. Last season, Hilton led the NFL in catches of 20 plus yards with 28 of them. Jeez. And he just, he just proved again that he's one of the league's best playmakers all around. He's never scored more than seven touchdowns in a season, and I don't really expect that to change in 2017. If you look at his usage inside the 10-yard line, it's never been high, and I don't think that that changes anytime soon, especially with Moncrief coming back. But you know, the 91 receptions along with those yards solidifies his, him as the top tier PPR play, regardless if he scores five, seven touchdowns. So the ceiling is crazy high for him. You know, maybe he'll have an outlier every year and score 10 touchdowns, who knows? But the receptions and the yards are gonna be there. And when you look at his floor, right, you have to look at what happens if Luck misses time. Well, we have sample sizes from that, right? Hilton and Luck both came in the league together in 2012. Here's a split for them to playing together. In split is with Andrew Luck, out of split is without him, obviously. I took 2014 to 2016 rather than from the rookie year because the last three years is more indicative of what we'd actually see, you know, coming in 2017, like the connection and the experience is already there. So these are the kind of numbers we'd probably expect rather than like what they would put up in the rookie year. So I didn't want to skew the split at all. First thing you see is obviously the, the drop off in fantasy points per game. He drops from 14.25 half PPR to 9.55. What I'd say is that, like that number, half, if you're putting up 10 points per game and half point PPR without Andrew Luck, you're still very much usable. I mean, obviously you're not gonna be the wide receiver one that you're being drafted as, but those are very much usable wide receiver three numbers. So that that is what I see the floor being with T.Y. Hilton. Right now he's going off the board as the eighth wide receiver, 16th overall. I think it's exactly where he should be as long as Luck is healthy. If Luck's slated to miss any time, I would have to drop Hilton behind the next tier of wide receivers like Cooper, uh, Doug Baldwin, and Des Bryant. He'll drop for sure just based on those splits, but it, it's hard to tell as of right now. And I think what I'm gonna do is once I finish these team outlooks, what I'll do is uh, as big reports come out or, or things that would change the dynamic of any of these team outlooks, I'll go back to the video and I'll comment on the video and I could pin comments. So like I could take whatever comment I want, pin it, and that means it's at the top of all the comment threads. Say it's like, oh, Andrew Luck starting the year on PUP. I'll do a comment and I'll kind of write up a paragraph of how that would affect the team outlook and I'll pin that at the top so everyone can see that. And then you guys can contribute into the thread, of course. So after Hilton, we move into Dante Moncrief. My dislike for Moncrief has been well documented on this channel. This year he was on my top five bus list. Last year he was also on my top five bus list. You know, he's a guy that's never been able to put that season together. Everyone keeps banking on it. Everyone puts him on his breakout lists every year, right? I get it. And it's only his fourth year. He's still young and he's still, and he's shown potential at some points, but people need to stop crying wolf every single year for this kid. You know what, go for Moncrief. You'll look cool as hell when you're one for four after saying he's gonna break out for the first three years and then you hit. I'm not gonna be part of that bandwagon. If he hits the jackpot, I'll be the first to congratulate you. It's a great job batting 250. You know, Moncrie's one of those guys that he'll continue to get hyped for two reasons. One of them was the raw measurables, like the 40, his combination of size and speed coming out of college. But he's proven to be nothing except a touchdown scorer. So these are a couple stats I want to read off. Over Moncrief's last 21 games, he's surpassed 70 receiving yards one time. One for 21. His yards after the catch average last year was 2.5. I don't think I need to tell you that was one of the worst of the NFL. Again, he's great near the end zone, right? Seven of his 30 receptions, he turned into touchdowns last year. He had six targets inside the 10 yard line, turned every one of them into touchdowns. Call me crazy, but something says regression there. 25% of your catches go for touchdowns? No. Now, what I will say is he's moved down draft boards quite a bit since the summer started and since I was really low on him. The pill's a little easier to swallow right now. He's going off the board at 63 overall. Wide receiver 34, so you could definitely, there's a lot of upside for someone going off the board as a wide receiver three or four. And if he keeps dipping, or even at that value, he's probably a pretty good value. Just based on the opportunity you're getting as the wide receiver number two in, in a, a high powered offense led by Andrew Luck. But again, you know, it, this a lot of this depends on Andrew Luck and, and his injury and how that plays an integral part into Moncrief's value. So I wanna do another split just like I did with Hilton. Moncrief came in the league 2014, and you could see in and out of the splits, now there's definitely not as much of a drop off in points for Moncrief as it is to Hilton, but that's really only because he's not scoring a lot either way. When you're not when you're scoring eight points a game, the drop off to seven doesn't seem that big, but it's only because you're not really 
that good without it either way. What I will point out is you see his touchdowns, right? It's almost at .5, half a touchdown a game with luck, .2 without luck. A lot of Moncrief's production comes from touchdowns. If he doesn't have luck in the lineup, he's not scoring touchdowns. Neither is the team really. So that's a huge hit to him. Never been one to rack up the yards. So, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't love Moncrief. I think he's just someone who just continually gets hyped up for, for the wrong reasons. Behind Hilton and Moncrief, we got a plethora of guys. We've got Kamar Aiken, the former uh, Ravens wideout. We have Chester Rogers, the sophomore undrafted free agent. And then we have Philip Dorsett, possibly the, fir the worst first round pick ever. No, probably not ever, but out of the University of Miami. Dorsett proved last year that he can't even handle number two duties while Moncrief was out. So he, in my eyes, he's wide receiver number five on this depth chart. Move over to Aiken, right? He's not flashy. He's only 28 years old, so he's got some left in the tank. He's got good size for an outside weapon. He's like 6'2", 215. And he's just a year removed from leading the Ravens uh, with 75 catches, 944 yards, right? So he's a good possession receiver. He came into the, in, into the Colts and was promised a real opportunity to compete and win that wide receiver three spot. Reports are coming out that he's not made the most of that opportunity. He hasn't really made any plays. What is going on inside my house? I don't know, man. It's just getting crazy out here. Someone's a Dante Moncry fan, I guess. They want to stick me from a paper. What was I saying about Aiken? Uh, yeah, and he's pretty much losing that battle to Chester Rogers for the wide receiver three role. It's kind of unfortunate because I saw Aiken being not a great fantasy player, but a, a good possession receiver behind Moncrief, like a good real life player for them. But as I said, Chester Rogers is taking advantage of his opportunity. The undrafted free agent out of Grambling State. He's small, he's like six foot, six one, 185 pounds. Not that fast, runs like a four, five, six, 40. Nothing jumps off the screen with him. He was very good in the preseason last year. He's like one of the preseason standouts. He led the team 14 catches, like 175 receiving yards and a touchdown. And he showed some play, some big playmaking ability, but I, I think I'd go back to the point that without an injury to Moncrief or Hilton, I don't see any of these guys playing a big part of that offense. If it does happen, I think Rodgers will be given every opportunity to kind of soar and to give value, right? As a wide receiver too in this offense, of course, you have, I'm not going to say it's guaranteed because we saw what happened with Dorsett last year, but you'll have the opportunities to be able to kind of shine. And Rodgers has shown he could he could do some big playability. So he's nothing more right now than, uh, you know, like a, a waiver wire guy to keep on your mind in redraft leagues. We move to the tight end position. Jack Doyle, another guy that my thoughts have been very well documented on. He's in my free agency recap tight end edition, my top eight sleepers for 2017 video, my top three sleepers tight end edition video, which I'll link here and in the description. In conclusion, to use a fourth grade ending paragraph starter, Doyle is that guy, the hands down best late round tight end choice you could have this year. I think he's still going off the board at tight end 13. A ridiculous value for, for how much production that position gets in this offense and with Andrew Luck as the quarterback. So like I said, if you wanna go watch that video, and I will get in depth about Jack Doyle and how much I like him. Also, Eric Swoop, his backup, is a guy that I've been hearing a lot of good things about. Decent numbers last year. As a tight end three, he, he had 15 catches, 300 yards, and a touchdown. When you look at the metrics, like in depth, he, he was playing really, really well. So, wouldn't be surprised if both of those guys put up top 20. Now, I expect Doyle, I think Doyle is going to be my seventh or eighth ranked tight end uh, when my rankings are finished. And I wouldn't be surprised if Eric Swoop finished inside the top 20 as well. But I'm not drafting him in redrafts until something happens to Doyle or whatever. Let's move on to the running back position. Good old Frankie G, Frank Gore. You now same shit, different toilet. 89th pick overall, RB30. New year, same spot. But is it really? Like I said with Moncrief, a lot of people just every year, they either wait for the breakout or they wait for the bust year. A lot of people do that with Frank Gore too, waiting on his downfall. They're plotting against him, they're scheming. Last year, I went into the season saying that Frank Gore was getting picked. It was like the eighth round. I loved him as a value play. He was basically guaranteed to finish as an RB2 just based on volume and his likeliness to stay healthy because he hasn't missed a game in like seven, literally since I think 2010, right? And that's exactly what happened. It played out perfectly. Literally no one else on the roster that could take touches away from him, at least over the first half of the year, right? He finished as RB12 overall in half point PPR leagues. You're like, oh wow, an RB1 in 12 team leagues. When you look at the points per game basis, he was only RB18. 
Very low ceiling, really nice floor. He did not look good last year though. He's entering his 13th NFL season, 34 years old. He averaged 3.9 yards per carry and Football Outsiders actually ranked their line, although they were terrible at a pass blocking rating, was like top five in terms of run blocking. So he did that behind a good line for run blocking, 3.9 yards per carry. Admittedly, it was actually an increase from the year prior, but it was from 3.739 still his two lowest yards per carry total of his 13 year career. And a lot of his fantasy production was saved by his receiving line, which is 38 catches, 277 yards, and four touchdowns. Those four touchdowns were a career high in the reception category for him. The catches and receiving yards were the highest total since 2010. So I would expect both of those to come back to the norm. When you look at him down by the goal line, he scored on just two of his nine attempts inside the five yard line last year. Only Chris Johnson had a worse scoring rate. He went one for eight with that many carries. You also look at how he's been playing over the first half of the year versus second half of the year. It's something that you see fall off a lot with older guys like Gore. From weeks one through nine last year, Gore scored at least 8.4 fantasy points, 0.5 PPR, every single game, nine games, right? But after their week 10 bye, he averaged just 3.6 yards per carry, and he didn't score a single rushing touchdown in, in the remaining seven games. And it's something that we saw in 2015 also. He had double digit fantasy points in seven of the first nine games, but following their week 10 bye, he only had double digit fantasy points twice. So now you're like, what's the difference between last year and this year? Like, why are you randomly just saying this is the year he's gonna bust? Other than his old age, the slowing down, he's got more competition in the backfield. They drafted Marlon Mack, and we saw Robert Turbin really come on the end of the year last year. I believe, stating on the record, this is the first time I've ever done this to Frankie G, 2017 is the year we see the almighty Frankie God Gore get dethroned. Robert Turbin, Marlon Mack, who are they? Turbin is, you know, this overhyped journeyman. People thought he, he was going to make some noise in, in Seattle, but he's, he's receiving a lot of praise this offseason, as he always does. There's always reports and rumors about how good he looks in the offseason. The Indianapolis star, Zach Kiefer, says to count on Robert Turbin having a bigger role in 2017. Colts offense coordinator Rob Chizinski talked up Robert Turbin for having a hell of a spring. Much better this spring than he was the time a of year a year ago. I mean, it's only right that Turbin receives more work in 2017. He scored seven touchdowns on just 48 carries. He had eight total touchdowns on the year. So when you look at carries inside the 10, Gore was four for 19, turning those into touchdowns. Turbin was much more efficient, turning seven of 14 into scores. He's just 27. He's got much fresher legs than Gore. Uh, he should open the season as the number two. Should see anywhere from like eight to 10 touches a game. It's not really enough to have standalone value unless he completely overtakes the goal line work, which I'm not sure we'll actually see. But I'm probably not considering him a handcuff either way because they do have Marlon Mack behind him as well. Turbin's going off the board 225 overall. I think it'll be a real RBBC running right by committee in Indy this year because of my boy Marlon Mack. He's the most intriguing player in this backfield to me. Basically going undrafted in fantasy drafts this year. He's out of University of Southern Florida. He is their all-time leader in rushing yards, total yards, and touchdowns. 5'11", 210 pounds, so good size. Posted a top five spark score this year at the Combine. He has really, really good versatility. He could do a lot. The only downfall would be, I guess, blocking. He's got, he's got to work as a pass blocker uh, this season. That's something he has to improve on. Otherwise, very good running the ball, very good catching the ball. It actually reminds me a lot of Tevin Coleman. What I think is Mack will actually play like a pretty big part of this offense over the second half of the year. He's not gonna like be the starter. He's not gonna get second string snaps to begin the year. But I think as Gore kind of starts to fade, I think Mack will come on strong. I was watching some film of him the other day, like some highlights and stuff. The kid could really, really, really move. You know, he could do it all. I mean, it's a very late round flyer, but I might mess around and draft him a few times. I think he's a great dynasty pick. I think he could be the future of that backfield. You know, Turbin is not their long-term answer. Frank Gore is definitely on his way out soon. So I think Marlon Mack has a very good chance to take over that backfield. And I think Mack will play like a, a pretty big part of the passing game this year. He moves way better than Gore does at this point in his career. And he's very athletic. So I think he catches a lot of balls out of the backfield. Should be a nice little upgrade for Luck coming out of the backfield. Then you have Josh Ferguson, rookie from last year. As always, every single rookie gets unnecessary hype as did he. He's going to need to compete for a roster spot this season, even being a sophomore. So just 15 carries last year, 30 total touches. So he's completely off everyone's radar, if not off the Indianapolis Colts. That'll wrap up this video. Indy Colts, we're done for the day. Next week, make sure you tune in for the last two team outlooks. Go give it that thumbs up video if you enjoyed the video. And subscribe if you are new. 
Go follow us on Twitter. Go subscribe to the blog. Go shop some gear. Whatever you got to do, I got to leave you with a question as always. Who finishes this year with more touchdowns? T.Y. Hilton or Dante Moncrief? And then Frank Gore and Robert Turman. So two different answers. Who finishes with more touchdowns total between these two and these two? All right, I'll see y'all next time.